yesterday we were talking about uh, uniform circular motion. So that is when something is moving around and around in a circle at a constant speed. In order for something to exhibit such motion, it must be accelerating where? Towards the center, a centripetal acceleration. Okay. And if there's an acceleration, accelerations are caused by what? Change in velocity. Okay, acceleration is a change in velocity. What causes that change in velocity? What causes an acceleration? Unbalanced forces. Right. A net force. Okay, so if I have an acceleration that is directed towards the center, I must also have a net force that is directed towards the center. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Last unit, we learned that net force equals mass times acceleration. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Did the net force and the acceleration always have the same vector? Yes, they did. They had to. One causes the other. Okay, so they always shared a vector. Yesterday, we learned that centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. That was one of the last things we talked about at the end of the day. So, what would fc equal? Remember, we just said if it's accelerating towards the center, that must be because there's a net force directed towards the center. And that's mass times acceleration. And centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. So how would I calculate centripetal force? Would it be uh, r equals v squared over v uh, c? No, how would I calculate this? I'm not, I'm not trying to manipulate this question. F net is mass times acceleration. So if you mass times your uh, centripetal centripetal uh, acceleration. Yeah. Right? Is that still mass times acceleration? Mm -hmm. But now it's applied to a circle. So yeah, Newton's second law. Still a thing. Okay? Still a thing in this unit. Now it's just being applied to a circle. Centripetal force is mass times centripetal acceleration, mv squared over r. You're going to use that formula all the time. Okay? And the other part of this also still holds true. That vector sum of all forces thing, okay? the vector sum of all the forces has to be towards the center. Okay? Most of the time for us, it's going to be just one force. When we do vertical circles, there could be two. Right? But for the most part, we're going to be dealing with one force acting as a centripetal force. And that's what we're going to look at today is what forces can act as centripetal forces? How do they do that? What does it look like? Okay? And then even to a point, how do we apply that? Okay, is that sort of making sense? All right, so yesterday we talked a little bit about that. Okay? And we said that um, the sun, or sorry, the moon orbits the Earth. What keeps the moon orbiting the Earth? Gravity. So does gravity act as a centripetal force? Absolutely it does. Okay? I mean, that's the pattern we see throughout the universe is that everything orbits something bigger. Okay? And that's because of gravity. If you want to turn a corner, what do you need? Friction. Can friction act as a centripetal force? Absolutely. All right? Tension. Okay? When I was whirling the, the tape around in the circle, okay? it can act as a centripetal force. Lots of forces can act as centripetal forces. Okay? Almost all of them are pulls. Okay? There's almost no pushing force other than like normal force at the bottom of a vertical circle okay? that is a pushing force back towards the center. Okay? Kind of strange, but true. Uh, um, <laughs> Okay, um, so 
Circular motion can't occur without a force pulling to the center. Okay, lots of forces can act as centripetal forces. Okay, we're going to look at how centripetal forces operate. Okay, and understand how banked curves and also unbanked curves use Newton's third law okay, to produce greater centripetal force. So, banked curve is like the on ramp out here to get on the highway two. Okay, you'll notice that when you take that, it's banked. Okay, it's not level like this. Okay, all the corners in town, they're all level. They're unbanked curves. Okay? But interchanges use banked curves because they allow us to take up less space, but they also increase the safety because they don't rely on friction to um, keep you in the corner. Okay, so this is what we were just talking about a minute ago. Okay? Centripetal force is mass times centripetal acceleration because it's a net force. Okay, um, and that's going to be mv squared over r. That formula is on your formula sheet, so it's not something you have to memorize or write down. Okay, it's on your formula sheet, and you're going to use it all the time. Okay, so that net force is the centripetal force, and it always points towards the center of a circle because without it, it wouldn't be circular motion. It has to be directed towards the center. Right, so in some cases, it's easy to identify the source of that centripetal force. Like when I was whirling the tape around, it's the same kind of thing as this. Okay, it's the tension and the strain. Okay? It's obvious you can see it. Okay? But in other times, it's not as obvious because you don't see the forces. You don't see gravity. You don't see friction necessarily. Okay? Things like that. So sometimes it's a little trickier. All right, so we want to first look at the effect of speed on centripetal force. Okay, so we know that centripetal force equals mv squared over r. According to that formula, if speed increases, what happens to centripetal force? It increases. How does it increase? Exponentially. Okay, so with greater speed, there's going to be an exponential requirement for greater centripetal force to maintain the circle. So if we're looking at this one here, we're going to look at two different speeds, 19 meters per second and 38 meters per second on a string that is 17 meters long. Right? So our first centripetal force is 19. So we got what is it, 0.9 kilograms. Okay, so our mass is 0.9 kilograms times 19 meters per second, but that's squared, right? divided by the radius of 17 meters. require 19.1 newtons worth of centripetal force or tension in the line. If I double the speed, how much bigger is that number going to get? It's going to quadruple, right? Okay, because this is an exponential relationship. So if we're doing that for the 30, uh, 38 meters per second, so we still got 0.9 kilograms down times 38 squared on the same 17, 17 meter long line. exactly four times that original value. So there's an exponential relationship between speed and centripetal force. Right? Something to consider when we're taking a corner. Okay? It is unlikely that any two surfaces in contact with each other could increase the force of friction between them exponentially for you to maintain your traction. Okay? Um, so if you were to take a corner at double the recommended speed, it is unlikely said corner would provide you with sufficient traction okay, to successfully negotiate the corner, okay, especially when it's snowy and icy. All right, so that's what we just did, exactly four times greater. Okay, and then what if I'm looking at radius instead? So what's the effect of radius going to be on centripetal force? Yeah. If I increase the radius, the centripetal force required is going to decrease. 
Okay, so if we're looking at that here, okay, with these two, then we've got this uh, rock tied to a string. Okay, the first step, C, it's it's um, 0.9 kilograms again, times uh, 28 squared divided by 11. Okay, we're going to get 0.9 Kind of gives us 64. If we do the same thing but with twice as much line, what number should I get? Half of them. I should get 32. If I go 0 0.9 times 28 squared divided by 22, yeah, well, I'm dividing by a number twice as large, I better get a number half as big. Okay? So the relationship there is inverse. Okay? With increasing radius, there is a linear decrease in centripetal force. Okay, so the wider you take a corner, the easier it is to negotiate it. Okay. Everybody all right with that? Okay. And we can see that pretty clearly here. If I'm whirling this around in this small circle, okay, does the string look pretty tight? Okay, so now if I do that same thing, this is the same speed. Okay, what is the cable look like, or the, the string look like. It's slack, and I don't have to hold it nearly as tight as I did when it was the small circle, because okay? it was whipping a lot fast. It was, well, it was the same speed, but the radius was a lot smaller, so I had to hold on a lot tighter. Okay? Right with that? Sorry about the noise. We had a pipe break in the back room there. Okay, so everyone's good with those relationships? Okay, what if I increase the mass? Doesn't it also need more force? Yeah, I'll need more force. Increasing mass. You've got bigger mass on the end, I've got to hold tighter. Right? Just kind of, if we're thinking about that logically. If I put a bigger mass and I do exactly the same thing I was doing with the smaller mass, I'm going to have more tension than the line. I'm going to need more centripetal force. But it's linear, okay? It's not exponential. Okay? It's like you're good that you got to do something here. So with this situation here, we're going around a corner, okay, and this corner isn't banked. What keeps us in the corner is static friction. Okay? Static means the tires in the road are not doing what? They're not slipping. Right. Okay? So this is just we're going around the corner, okay, and we're using static friction. Right? Which is always bigger, static or kinetic? Static. Static's always bigger. Okay, so what does that mean for drifting the corner? Which which should be more effective? More kinetic. Static. Okay, because if you're drifting the corner, what are your tires doing? They're sliding. Okay, and in fact, it is more efficient to take a corner without skidding than it is or drifting than it is to drift it. Okay? Because what happens when you drift it is you swing the back end around so that it points almost tangential to the circle, and then the rear wheels are powering. Okay? So they're creating a force that's tangent to the circle. It does have a component that's kind of pointed towards the center that's keeping you in the corner, but it's not the same as just using friction to go around the corner. Okay? It's using actually power from the engine and some kinetic friction, both of which are not directly angled towards the center, but have a component towards it to get you around. Okay? The other thing is that if you exit that corner and now want to accelerate on a straightaway, which situation is better? Your tires are locked up okay? and you accelerate, or your tires are already spinning and now you want to accelerate. Which one's going to result in a better acceleration? Already spinning. Tires locked up. Static friction. Okay? If my tires are already spinning when I exit that corner, I've got to try and regain the traction 
or I've just got to rely on, well, my tires are spinning and I look uber cool, okay, as I go around this corner, and I'm going to pow on, and this thing is just going to go, and it's it's not. It's not as efficient. It's why you don't see like Formula One drivers drift corners in a race. Okay, it's not as fast. Okay, you go around that corner, and if you keep your tires locked. Okay, so that your wheels aren't spinning, okay, you've got that nice static friction, you get around the corner and you can hit the gas and you maintain traction, you get all of that force propelling forward. If you're already skidding when you come around that corner and you, you're, you know, you've got your tires going, they're not providing you nearly as much traction to power the forwards. Plus, you also have to correct the oversteer before you can get the front of the car pointed in the right direction. Okay? So it's never as efficient. Okay? I couldn't find the video clip of it, but Mythbusters actually did a thing where they brought the Drift King in, and they had they ran a, they ran a track. It's probably the same guy from Kenya that woke me up. Okay, so. If I come around that corner and I've already got the tire spinning, so they had this, they had the Drift King try this, okay? And so Adam and Jamie both ran this course and they did it drifting and they did it without drifting and they were always faster not drifting. So they figured, all right, well let's let's bring the Drift King in. He's he's a professional. Let's see if he can beat our non-drifting time. And he couldn't do it. He's close just because he's an incredible driver. Adam and Jamie are not at all professional stunt drivers, okay? But it did go to show that while his route looked way cooler, okay? I mean, there's no discounting the drift in the corner. It looks incredibly cool, okay? Uh, it takes an incredible amount of skill. Not drifting it is always faster. So it's kind of a dumb question. Hey, uh, in, in rally driving, why do they like mostly drift the corners then? It would be faster just to go around them. I couldn't tell you. Is there is there style points? No, there's no style. <laughs> there's style points. I don't know anything about rally racing. No. Um, I, honestly, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. Okay. I don't have a good answer to that. Next <laughs> Yeah, maybe it is different in the dirt because it'd be hard. It, like once you come around a corner, because dirt never has as much traction as asphalt, maybe your tires spin anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that one. I don't have a good answer to it. Sorry. And yeah, maybe it's just because it doesn't look cool. It doesn't look cool. I always wonder, I've seen that, and you know, those people stand right next to the corners, and I think, yeah. man, that's really crazy. Because, okay, I mean, those cars sometimes go right off. Yeah. It's fun watching the zoom where they like drift in the back of the tree and they go flying into the crowd. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And yet, this is still a thing, and it's still allowed, and people still do it. What are those tickets worth? They better be free. Do you have the corner tickets? The death zone? Yeah, yeah. the death zone tickets. Yeah. All right, so if we're going around a corner and we're doing an unbanked corner the right way, we're relying on static friction, okay, certainly the person inside the car, the person inside the car is going to feel a push from the side of the car because what does the person inside the car want to do? Yeah, they want to leave the circle. They want to obey Newton's first law and travel in a nice straight line. Okay, that's not going to work here, okay, because they're belted in and there's the side of the car, okay. So when they hit the side of the car, the side of the car provides a centripetal force pushing back towards the center. That's what keeps you moving in the circle as well. Okay, because obviously you as the occupant are not attached to the road. So would that, the force of the car pushing back on you, because you said most forces don't push, like, would that be like normal force? That's the normal force, exactly. That's that's the one that's going to be a pushing force. Okay. Yeah. okay? All right. So if the force of friction on an unbanked corner is providing us the centripetal force, could I mathematically say this? It's the only force, right? Because this the vector sum of all forces for that situation. Yeah. It is. I would watch that. Okay. So this is what we have to do with centripetal force problems. We have to identify what force is acting as the centripetal force and then set it equal to centripetal force, much like we did with any second law problem in the second unit. So what it ends up being is something like this. I mean, that's the 
formula for force of friction, right? Okay, since the road's level, what force is equal to the normal force? Force of gravity. Force of gravity. What happens to M? And it's right. Let's go test it. Okay? The reason you're told in a larger vehicle to take a corner slower is because usually the center of gravity is much higher. And it's not about skidding, it's about tipping. Okay? Yeah, a bigger, heavier vehicle is more likely to tip over okay, than it is to slide out of the corner, unless it's a tank, which is built really low to the ground. But that becomes an entirely different one. Okay? Tank doesn't really go that fast. Ooh, they can go past the straight line. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah, they're fast for a tank, but. Have you seen the new ones? They're like 65 knots, though. Which I, I get it. That's not fast for a car. Like, compared to a car. Where they can go 65 miles an hour is fast. <coughs> like, anywhere, basically. Tank. Okay, so mass doesn't matter. Mass cancels. This is why you don't see separate speed limits for corners. Okay? If mass was a factor, Every corner that has a speed limit would have to have a hundred speed limits. Okay, if your car has this mass, you can go this fast. If your car has this mass, you can go. This. There would be accidents galore because you'd be looking inside. Which one is mine? Go, oh, I missed the corner. Okay, but it doesn't. Mass doesn't matter. Okay, mass cancels. Everybody can take the corner equally. Okay, mass is irrelevant in that situation. Okay, so your speed that you can negotiate a corner at is dependent on the coefficient of friction, which we learned about last week, okay? The acceleration due to gravity, because that's what squeezes the two things together, right? And the radius of the corner, okay? Those three things determine how fast you can take a corner, not your mass, okay? How sticky the two surfaces are, the acceleration due to gravity, and R, okay, the radius. Okay, so let's have a look at this situation here. So when car manufacturers are, I'm gonna go. Well, what a pin in that. Okay, so if we're looking at um, what's called the skid pad test, okay, this is how all car manufacturers test the cornering abilities of their vehicles when they're manufactured. Okay, so what they do is they have a circle painted on the ground. They know the radius of the circle. And they just run the cars around it faster and faster and faster until they skid out. Okay? And then from there, they can calculate the cornering acceleration that that car, Alec, is capable of doing. Okay? If you've got a really good handling sports car, that number can be close to 1. Okay? So the, the cornering acceleration is close to 1G. Right? Uh, most average passenger vehicles so, are somewhere around 80% of gravity, somewhere in there. Okay. If you're talking about like a you know, cargo van, well, that's probably more like 0.65 G or something like that because it's top heavy. Right? So this is what they do. They understand that in this corner, the centripetal force is being provided by the force of friction, okay? as we showed before. So if we want to calculate the maximum speed that this thing can go at, okay, we simply have to manipulate our formulas. So we know Fc is mv squared over r, thank you, okay? And force of friction is mu times the normal force, which on a level surface, which is what this is because it's unbanked, the normal force is equal to? Force of gravity. Okay, so that's what we've got as our setup. Now we already said before we left that the masses are going to cancel. And I'm trying to solve for V. So what do I need to do with R? Okay, so I bring it over to this side, okay? And that's going to leave me with V squared equals mu. Okay? But we want V, so we want V to be equal to the square root of mu. Okay? 
Now I just have to plug in my numbers. This will get me the uh, maximum speed in both ideal conditions and icy conditions. Now under icy conditions, I have one ninth as much friction available to me. How much slower am I going to have to go? But I've got a square root sign there. A third. Yeah, I'll have to go three times slower. Okay, I've got nine times less friction, but remember there's an exponential relationship there. The square root of one ninth is one third. Okay, so if we're looking at ideal conditions, this is going to be 0 0.9 times 9.81 times uh, 50. So, under ideal conditions, we can negotiate that corner at 21 meters per second. Under less than ideal conditions, where I have one ninth as much friction, what's it likely to come out to? A quarter of a third. A third. What's a third of 21? Okay. certainly plays a part and obviously the coefficient of friction can decrease pretty quickly when conditions change even from dry to wet asphalt there's going to be a pretty major change in, the, in our uh, cornering ability because of that reduced coefficient of friction all right so does everyone follow kind of what we did there okay we set the centripetal force equal to the force providing the centripetal force okay net force and centripetal force are very much like each other they're not really a force in and of themselves, they're being provided by other forces, or the sum of other forces. Okay, So in this case, a lot in this unit, we're going to take Fc and just set it equal to whatever is holding the object in that circle. Gravity, friction, tension, right? whatever it happens to be. Okay, are with how that one works? Now, bank curves. Bank curves work a little bit differently. Okay? Um, if we bank a curve, we can still rely on friction. Okay? And in most cases, we still do. But what does banking the curve do to help us take that corner better? Because obviously, you can take a banked corner way faster than you can take an unbanked corner. Gravity. Well, not gravity, because gravity acts down. Gravity doesn't really help. It goes against centrifugal force. Yes, it goes against centrifugal force by providing a Centri centripetal force. Okay. So how does the bank provide a centripetal force? Would normal force now be pushing towards the center? Exactly. Normal force is going to push towards the center. What we really get with an incline, with a uh, with a bank curve, is an incline blade. Okay, so if this is my banked corner, it really just looks like that, right? It's an inclined plane. So when I'm driving around it, gravity pulls down, okay? Normal force pushes up, okay? And a parallel goes down the plane. But here's the thing. That's when you're just sitting on it. If you're driving around it, do you push harder than if you're just sitting there? You do, because your inertia wants you to go through the corner. It wants you to leave the circle. So you actually push a bit harder, and it actually alters that triangle that we learned about before. Okay? So this angle here is still the angle of the bank. But now, Fg is this side. Okay? This is going to be our centripetal force. And this is our normal force. Okay, so gravity wants to pull down. 
Okay? Normal force can only ever act perpendicular to the surface providing it, so it sticks straight out. Okay? And the horizontal part of that points back towards the center of the circle. No matter where you are, that top part of that diagram is always pointed back to the middle. Okay? So that part acts as a centripetal force. So you get that, plus you get friction okay, between you and the road. So a banked corner can allow you to go a lot faster while turning than an unbanked corner, okay? because you get that additional force of the road keeping you in. And I don't know if anybody watched like at the last Olympics, they have that, that, in, that uh, indoor uh, bike racing, okay? Yeah, but it's like the, the walls of the track are practically vertical, okay? They have to go really, really fast to stay on that corner, okay? So the more you bank this, the faster, theoretically, you could go. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, so is there a problem with banking a normal road used for civilian use a whole bunch? Yeah, the more you bank it, the more you're going to want to fall down it. It is a hill after all, okay? So the steeper you make it, the faster you have to go around it to avoid going down into it, okay? So we don't typically bank exit ramps and things and on-ramps much more than, you know, like you almost never get a double-digit angle of bank, okay? It's not practical to do that because if it does get slippery and people are overcautious, they're likely to slide down and into the corner, okay? And you kind of feel bad for those people because they were just trying to be cautious. You feel less bad for the person who's into the guardrail on the outside because they were just going too fast and they created their own problem, okay? But somebody who goes a little slower because they're worried about, you know, going out the thing and goes into the middle, okay? Well, we don't want that to happen, okay? I mean, we don't want the guy in the guardrail on the outside either, but there's not really any control of what happens. Okay, so we bank a corner like this. This is the same reason why a plane banks to turn. Right? A plane can only turn so much with the rudder. Okay, because on the tail there's, there's just a rudder. That can make small course corrections, but it's not going to turn the plane very much. If a plane wants to turn, it dips its wings like this. Okay? And it's the same idea. Normally, and then doesn't it just like pull off and then like collapse to create that force of gravity? Sort of, yeah. Normally, the wings create lift, which is an upward directed force. The wings can only produce a force that is perpendicular to them, up. Okay? But when you bank a plane, that same lift is now directed at an angle, which means that it has a horizontal component that's directed towards the center of the circle. The problem with banking a plane is that when you bank it, the lift is no longer vertical, and the plane is likely to also do what? Yeah, it descends. This is why it's part of the landing pattern. Planes typically fly in a few circles before they land because that allows them to slowly lose altitude. Okay? As opposed to, hey everybody, we're going, we're going to land now. That means there are some airports that are looking on planes where that's what it felt like. Okay? Um, but most of the time they're going to make a few gentle turns in order to lose altitude. This is a big concern if you're in a dogfight in a fighter jet because they'll oftentimes turn their wings perfectly sideways. Okay? At that point, what is that plane doing? Falling. It's falling, exactly. It might be turning, it's going to be doing that, but it's also falling at exactly the same time because it's no longer generating any vertical lift. You've turned the wings sideways. Okay? So it's actually a great way, and the reason why, um, it's an evasive tactic. Okay? So if you've seen any like you know, the fighter jet movies or like, you know, Top Gun or anything, okay? one of the first things they do if they're fired upon is they bank one way or the other, okay? And what that allows them to do is not only turn horizontally, but also move vertically quickly, okay, to try and evade, you know, a scraping run from a machine gun or a missile, okay, or something like that. And then usually they'll deploy countermeasures and chaff and flares and stuff. And it all looks really cool when it's still on TV, okay? Um, but there's a reason for all of it. Okay, does that sort of make sense? So when we bank, all we're doing is using another force. We're turning a force we already have so that it has a component that points back towards the center and allows us to turn. Okay? That's the purpose of banking a road or banking a plane. Okay? In fact, these NASCAR tracks are banked so steeply that they actually have to, when they pave them, 
they have a crane that holds the paving machine on the track because it's so steep that the paving machine tries to slide down. It's so steep. Okay? Most of those cars, they just, they're going so fast, they just stay in the corner or even go out of it. But if there's ever a collision on a corner, where do all the cars go? Yep, they all slide right into the center. Okay? It's good for a couple of reasons. It gets them out of the way. Okay? So nobody gets hit or less people get hit by cars coming from behind. Okay? But it's also because they're, this thing is banked so steeply that there's just not enough friction if they're no longer moving at a high speed to hold them there. Then they'll just fall right down. Okay? All right. Making some sense? Okay. So as I was saying, this works in this way. We've got these forces involved. Okay? If it's a plane, it's, you know, it's lift instead of normal force. Right? So we've got that, and we can calculate kind of our angle of bank. So we might know the radius of our circle, okay? and we would know this side here. Okay? We would know what gravity is. So we could calculate kind of what speed would be safe for a certain angle of bank and a certain radius. Okay? Okay. Right, so if we're looking at the kind of the derivation of this, so they've drawn a similar thing here. Okay. Um, so if I'm looking at this line here being my normal force, this side here, which is the opposite side, is the one that's directed towards the center. So it's Fc. But it's also Fn times the sine of theta. Okay, because it's the hypotenuse and it's the opposite side, so it's times the sine of theta. Gravity is this side. Okay? It's the opposite side, or the adjacent side, sorry. Okay? So um, if I'm looking for this angle here, okay, the tan of that angle is going to be the opposite side, which is mv squared over r. Okay, my centripetal force, divided by my adjacent side, which is mg, gravity. Want to follow what I'm doing here? Okay, I don't know what the hypotenuse is, but I know that the opposite side is the centripetal force, and I know the formula for that is mv squared over r. I know that the adjacent side is gravity, and I know that's m times g. Tan is opposite over adjacent. So I'm just dividing those two things. Okay, so what's going to happen to the masses? Okay. okay. And so when I simplify this formula now, what I end up with is this. The tan of theta equals v squared divided by r times g. This is our banked curve formula. It is on your formula sheet. It's not something you're ever going to have to derive like I just did. Okay? But it is something that we're going to use. Okay? So what it tells us is the speed you can take a, a bank curve at is dependent on the angle and the radius and graph. Okay? All right with that. Does this look similar to our unbanked curve situation? In our unbanked curve situation, we have this. Yes? Mass is canceled, right? OK. The thing that holds me in an unbanked corner is the angle. The thing that holds me in, a bank, in an unbanked corner is friction. See any similarities? Whatever holds you in the corner is dependent on the same three things. How fast you go, how big the corner is, and gravity. Okay? When it comes right down to it. Okay? In one of them, it's the angle of bank. In the other one, it's the coefficient of friction. OK, so is it possible then to make a bank curve that would be safe to, to traverse even if there was no friction? Yes. Okay. In fact, most bank curves are designed that way. If they were to be covered in perfectly frictionless ice, and you were able to perfectly maintain your speed at the recommended posted speed value, you'd be able to go through that corner no problem. 
Okay? You go any faster, you're going up to the outside. You go any slower, you're going into the inside. Okay? But they are negotiable at a frictionless condition. these forces in a bank curve. So we've gone over that. This was the derivation I did, right? Opposite over adjacent. For the interruption, please ignore the last bell. Done. I already mm -hmm. forgot it ever happened. Okay, so if we're looking at a true bank curve, this is the situation that we have in play with friction included. Okay, we would have that component of the bank going back towards the middle. Right? We would have the coefficient of, we would have the force of friction, which actually acts along the plane, okay, and acts down because it keeps you from going this way. Everyone follow me there? Which means it's not all acting as a centripetal force, is it? Again, only its horizontal component is acting as a centripetal force. So it's actually a fairly small part of keeping you in a bank curve. Friction plays a very small role in the other advantage of a bank curve, and this has nothing to do with friction or centripetal force or anything like that, just has to do with inertia, is this is much likely, much less likely, sorry, to have a rollover. Okay? On an unbanked corner, if you have a high load and you turn the corner, the, ten, the inertia of the vehicle is to go over to the outside. But if you bank the corner, okay, you have less of that because you're actually tilting against the inertia of the, of the load. So it's less likely to tip, provided you don't go too slow. If you go too slow, then the tip is to the inside. Okay. Same as before, but nobody's going to go that slow. You wouldn't park a semi truck on an exit ramp, okay, because it could tip over if it was loaded very high. Okay. Now, in speaking of like applying physics to something, if you're loading a semi truck and this is your semi trailer. Where do you put the heaviest stuff? Yeah, absolutely. For a number of reasons. You don't put the light stuff on the bottom because the heavy stuff will crush it. Okay? But also, you want the heaviest stuff near the bottom because it is less likely to cause it to lean. Okay? If you start turning, the more weight you have above the center of mass, the more inertia you have above the center of mass, and the more likely you are to tip over. Okay? So you want to put your heaviest material lower to the ground okay, so that you have less inertia over time. Wouldn't you also want to try and put it more like towards the like, <coughs> like front, like where the gap is of the semi truck as well? Um, to prevent like a jackknifing? Yes. Yeah. If you have a lot of weight at the back and you slam on the brakes on the truck, yes, having a lot of weight at the back of the trailer is going to increase the likelihood of the jackknifing. Yeah. So if you place more weight like above the wheel, that doesn't help the truck. It does, yes. Okay. It helps with friction if those are the power deals. Yeah. yeah, that's why we put sandbags and cinder blocks and stuff in the back of the pickup truck. Okay. Yeah, because it increases the weight, which increases the normal force, which increases okay. friction. Yeah. Okay, um, so with a bank curve here, so if we want to determine the angle at which a frictionless curve should be banked for a speed of 35 meters per second, okay, this is our bank curve formula. So we would use it to calculate what theta would be, and it would require us to basically just manipulate this by bringing tan over to the other side, which means doing the inverse tan okay, of v squared, so 35 squared okay, divided by uh, 550 times 9.81, right? And that'll give us an angle of bank of 13 degrees, which is fairly extreme, actually. I know 13 degrees doesn't seem like much. But that's a pretty extreme angle of bank. You generally get warnings on mountain hills, and like you're in the mountains going up a hill, if the slope is more than 8%. Okay, and those seem very steep. Okay, when in actual fact they're really not. Eight degrees is like what? It's 10% of vertical, right? Just under 10% of vertical. So it's uh, it's actually not a lot, but 13 degrees would be a fairly steep banked curve. 
Right? Like if you parked on it, you probably, your coffee would probably spill out of your cup. Incidentally, why does your coffee not spill out of your cup if you go around the corner at speed? Inertia. Yeah, yeah inertia. inertia. Exactly. That's that whole thing with the trucks, right? We the trucks are less likely to tip over. The coffee is also less likely to spill because its inertia goes to the bottom rather than up the top. Okay, so it all works out. Not that you would ever drive with an open cup of coffee. My parents did. Yeah, my parents did. With a mug. Yeah. With no lid. No, no lid. Just put it on the center. Kind of the car. Is there a car in that? <laughs> no, it's usually. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Dude, that that, that just like that just like, triggers me. Like I don't know why. So it's like, oh no, no, why did you do that? Like, so I have to clean it up. Yeah. I guess that was a Type A personality. Okay. Um, we don't need to do that. Okay, let's have a look at this one. This is a good practical application kind of question. How many people have ever got a rock in the windshield? Okay. When does that happen? Don't say when a car is in front of me. <laughs> Obviously. Okay. But if the car in front of you, when there's a car in front of you, when does it spit the rock? When it speeds up. When it's speeding up. It doesn't spit the rock if it's traveling at a constant velocity, generally speaking. Okay, there are exceptions that it goes over a bump or something. But generally, okay, it only spits the rock if it's accelerating. Why? No, well, not a fluctuation, no. I mean, there's a change, but not an up and down change. What holds the rock in the tire? Friction. Okay, so friction is acting as a centripetal force that's holding the rock in the tire. Because the rock wants to leave the tire. Okay? It doesn't want to stay in the tread of the tire. That tire gets moving. They, the inertia of the rock is to go in a straight line, which would be out of the tire. Now, the tire is vertical. So while the speed is fairly constant as it's going around and around, where are more forces trying to help the rock out of the tire? Okay. There's a, a number of forces. There's first off gravity trying to pull the rock out. Okay, but there's also the fact that the weight of the car is pushing down on the tire, which can change the shape of the tread where it's contacting the road. Right. So the most likely place for the rock to be dislodged is right here, and then it will follow a projectile arc that encounters your brand new. Windshield, because that's when you get cracked. And you don't get a crack in a windshield that's already cracked. Okay? That's Murphy's Law. You only get it when you've just pulled out of the auto glass place, and you got that bright, nice, shiny windshield. Smash! That's when it happens. Okay? So it's most likely to happen when they are accelerating, because at some point, the force of friction is not sufficient to hold the rock in the tire anymore, and it dislodges, and it comes out. OK, make sense? Okay. And it's going to come out here at the bottom. Now, are there times where stuff can come out at other spots? Yeah. If you've just driven on a muddy road, okay, you come out of the mud, get on the road, yeah, mud's flinging everywhere. It's going to be inside your wheel well. It's going to be all over the top, everywhere. That's a little bit different. Okay. Um, there's that polar nature of water and all that kind of stuff that's holding the mud on the tire. Yeah. Okay. But generally, this is where a rock that's lodged in the tread is going to come loose. Okay? Stuff that's just all over the tire just goes all over the place, okay? generally speaking. All right. Everybody okay with that idea? So there, what should you do to avoid that? Yeah. Find that sweet spot. Okay? Because there is a sweet spot. You, if you're really close, it might just go right over your car. Okay? But it's not good to tailgate somebody. Okay? And then if you're too far away and they're really speeding away, that arc could be big enough that it could still get you. And so, yeah, there's not really a solution other than try and keep your distance and hope. Yeah. Or just tell Or just get insurance on your last yeah. Yeah. Also, the higher your vehicle, the less likely you are to get the rock in the windshield. Yeah, yeah. it's more likely for it to go through your grill in here. I guess, but I haven't had too many problems with that. Oh, really? No. My brother got 
261 kilometers per hour, um, what do we want to probably convert that to? Meters per second. So we'll divide that by 3.6 to start off with. Okay, um, so 261 divided by 3.6. Okay, so 72.5 meters per second is our speed, and we know the radius is 0.35, so we're going to bring, um, sorry, we're looking for period, and then we're going to divide both sides by B, so we're basically just cross multiplying. And so that would be then 2 times pi times uh, 0.35 divided by uh, 72.5, which should give us our 0 0.0303 seconds. Okay, is that pretty fast? Yes. Really zooming. Yeah. Okay, speaking of zooming, a pulsar is, yeah, fast. Okay, like super fast. Uh, so it discovered the fastest spinning collapsed star. It has a radius of 16.1 kilometers. Now keep in mind that a pulsar is like, it has the mass of 10 times our sun. And it's packed into something 16 kilometers across. So it would easily fit inside the Calgary city limits. Okay, imagine all the mass, like 10 times the mass of our sun packed into something like that. Okay, and it's spinning really, really, really fast. Okay, so it spins at a rate of 716 hertz. Is that a period or a frequency? Frequency. frequency. All right, so I know F is 716 hertz. Okay, I know the radius is 16,100 meters. Okay, and I'm looking for the speed at its equator. So V will equal. 2 times pi times r times f. That's that manipulation we learned yesterday, okay? Because normally the formula is written like this, okay? But t equals 1 over f, and f equals 1 over t, so I can just put f in up here. All right, so when I've got that, I'm just going to go 2 times pi times 16,100 times 716. And when I do that, I get 7.24 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Okay, to give you a comparison, in case you don't think that's really fast. That's the speed of light. So this thing is spinning really fast. Okay? Like there would be time dilation kinds of things going on there because of how fast you would be moving. Although it would be hard to stand on the surface of one of these and not be fried. But like, you know. Would you even be able to see the like you were away from them, then would you be able to see Yes. Pulsars pulse. That's why they're called pulsars. So they flash. And oh, those yeah, flashes can okay. tell us the rate at which they're spinning. Yeah. Okay, making sense how to use those two formulas? All right. Can you align this thing? Um, simply the force of the collapsing mass. Like so when the when the star collapses, it's already mm -hmm. like our, our sun spins too. But when the star collapses, it creates like so you go from having a big radius to having a really small radius, right? The speed goes up. Isn't that also on 
No, a supernova is like an obliteration. It's just gone. It yeah, becomes a black get, like small and small and small and so the point where they like almost collapse on their side. They they actually do kind of a they, they expand, they contract, there's like there's proton degeneracy forces and all these other things that go into it, but it, it's a big long process. Okay. Um Let's have you guys try those ones. They're fairly straightforward, but they have to do with uh, centripetal acceleration, that formula, from yesterday. As well as these other ones here, right? The T pi r over T equals D, okay? Um, to do with those. So let's give those ones a try and see where we're at after that.